more or less something close to one to one. Um, here are what we currently have, um, very nice OCT systems. In fact, OCT was the fastest um, uh, taken up medical imaging modality, apparently, in the history of medicine. At least that's what uh, Eric Swanson claims. <laughs> um, but he sells a lot of them, so it's like believing uh, estate agents about the price of houses going up. Uh, anyway. Very expensive uh, systems, or at least, yeah, I suppose by comparison with MRI and so on, moderately expensive, but too expensive for primary care or for um, for small hospitals to have, or even eye care uh, places to have. So the prices are somewhere between 45,000 uh, euro and 120,000 euro, and they look something like this. Um, we wanted to make a smaller and cheaper. Uh, version of this, and ideally something that could fit inside a mobile phone, which maybe sounds uh, a little daft, but let's see. Um, and uh, the idea was that what we see here is actually not very different to what you have in a DVD player. You have a light source, you have an interferometer of some sort, a beam splitter, you have a detector, uh, you have um, a mirror on a voice coil and you have a sample, in that case a CD or a DVD would be here, uh, but we have a finger here. Okay. All right. Um, and actually here you have it. Uh, so that's what you have in a CD player. <coughs> this is what uh, we have in our system, which is a voice coil, which is very cheap. You, get them as part of the camera in this thing, and it's a very small part of the camera. The cameras, by the way, for these phones, um, Samsung won't pay more than two euros for the camera. Okay. Now, they will buy a billion of them, but they won't pay more than two euros for the camera. It's a very, very fancy camera. It's a very, very good camera, but they won't pay more than two euros for it. Um, and the voice coil is a small part of that. Um, uh, actually, the voice coil that we're moving for this, uh, we're using for this, is by a company called Alps, and they got an order for something close to a billion from from uh, Apple of these specific voice coils. So uh, they're very, very cheap, twenty cents or something like that. Anyway, they move the mirror in and out, um, and we use that to take the image. Uh, but this won't move one millimeter in and out. It will only move about 20 microns. It's a very small distance. Okay, so we want you should be going this amount, but our voice coil will only do this. So how do we get the full scan into the tissue in that case? Um, well, what we do is this. We put a partial mirror in here, and that means that in the first reflection, we get a small scan, which is about 20 microns. But the second time, we have a reflection, so part of the light goes through twice, uh, is reflected because it's a partial mirror, part of the light goes through twice, and we get this longer scan, which is deeper, and then it goes through three times, we get another scan here, and another scan here, and another scan here. They're all actually along this direction, but just offset, so you can see where they are, you put them all together and now you've got a one millimeter scan but by only moving your uh, mirror on top of the voice coil by 20 microns. So that's basically just a very cheap and a very small way to build an interferometer. Um, uh, Professor Pogney is going to talk about that sort of stuff tomorrow, so I'll leave it to him. But uh, so the kinds of things you can use this for are uh, there must be. So here, typically, what you see on the surface of uh, the tissue is some kind of mark like this, and the question is, is that just a freckle or some kind of uh, natural mark, or is it really uh, part of a melanoma? And if you look at the surface, it's hard to tell. What you're really worried about is that this uh, melanoma is deeper in the tissue, and if it's deeper and it has gone through the dermal epidermal uh, junction, uh, it might metastasize, it might move to other organs, and that's
that's what kills you. It's not the tumor here, it's the movement to other organs that's going to kill you. So how do you know from this dermoscope image uh, whether that is deeper or not? You just see um, some kind of image. Well, if you combine a dermoscope with OCT, you can pick any point on here and you can look at, uh, look for the melanin and you can see where uh, in the depth is that and what is the structure underneath. And just to illustrate what you see with, um, with OCT on the fingerprint, uh, I mentioned these uh, spirally ducts um, and they are lined up along uh, the fingerprint, so the bright spots are um, the sweat because water has a very different refractive index uh, to the surrounding tissue, so it gives a bright reflection. They line up along those uh, fingerprints, ridges. Uh, here is another fingerprint, but this one is called the subsurface fingerprint, or actually the primary ridges, the secondary ridges are on the surface. This is laid down in the 19th week in the womb, so that's what it looks like. It gets bigger, but the pattern stays the same. In order to supply these blood vessels, or these cells, living cells, which are coming up like that, you must have a blood supply. And here we're cutting across those capillary loops, so the dots you see are a cut across of the capillary loops coming to the surface. That follows the same pattern as this, and underneath them, there is a horizontal plexus of the microcirculation which is feeding the loops up into the, uh, the ridges close to the surface. And we believe that this is a much, uh, among other applications, it's a much more secure way to check your fingerprint than uh, just taking a picture essentially of what's on the surface, which is maybe not the sec most secure way to access your bank records and transfer money. Um, and if you don't believe me about uh, the blood vessels lining up along the tissue here, along these ridges, you can inject yourself with um, a wax uh, which can be seen under a scanning electron microscope and you can corrode away your finger, okay, so that you only have the blood vessels there, okay. Um, I think this person was already dead from this done, I hope, at least, yeah? Uh, I'm sorry, what about the um, burned uh, skin? Mm -hmm. People that burn their fingerprints, does it work, this, on the um, burned skin? Well, it depends on how deep the burn is. If it's a very superficial burn and they just burnt the ridges, then mm -hmm. we can see uh, this layer is about a third of a millimeter below the surface, so if they haven't burnt that, we can see that. <laughs> this is um, maybe half a millimeter below the surface, so if they haven't burnt so deep, we could see that, or this is maybe um, almost a millimeter below the surface. So it depends on how much they burn, burnt it. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, that's a little suspicious anyway if they burnt just their fingertips and all of them. Okay. <laughs> you could use it to identify burnt dead people or in case of something also. Yeah, if, or if, if there was enough left. But I think people prefer to use teeth. They have records, of course. Yeah. Yeah. If they have records. Okay. Um, so that was a nice one published just last year, which, which just uh, proves that idea. Um, and I don't see that graph here. I thought I had it. But basically, the reason that these things grow uh, here along these ridges is that the microcirculation must come within 65 microns of every living cell. In normal tissue and in tumors within about a hundred microns of every living cell so it's a little different for tumors but um, so if you're delivering drugs to the tissue this is why um, the blood supply is a great way to, to do that because you get within 65 microns it's really very close to every living cell and there's a great debate at the moment about um, what is happening uh, what is controlling uh, the blood flow in the tissue. So if I, uh, the, the, the blood vessels, the smallest ones, are surrounded by these 
pericytes, so your endothelial cells and pericytes, which are around them. Um, and here is a typical diagram that you might be shown, uh, which is essentially uh, showing the blood flow from the ar arteries through the arterioles into the capillaries, giving up its oxygen and coming out through the venules. And the idea is that there is smooth muscle here which is controlling the flow. There are some sphincters which are controlling the flow. There is no smooth muscle over here. So this is a kind of a passive system. And this is an active system which is controlling everything over on this side. This, I think, is the regular textbook view of things. But that might be changing. Um, first of all, let's look at this blood flow in the capillaries. And I've more or less told you that this image uh, is impossible to get, to, to see blood cells uh, moving within living human beings. So, anybody have any idea how this video was got? I think it's in the, from the frog's lungs, a bit like LPG. Okay? And the frog's lungs are basically transparent, and so you could see this, but I think in a human it's... Frog's tongue. Could be the tongue also? Okay. that had moving um, blood and they found that in normal tissue you see there's this rapid fall off at around 65 microns. So cells don't live more than 65 microns from, um, from the microcirculation except in tumors um, but maybe they only live a short time uh, because tumors are growing rapidly and you know that they grow in the penumbra and maybe the cells they're talking about here are really so close. So maybe it's almost the same thing. In any case, um, I think this is important to know that you have these vessels um, in these areas. I want to say a few words if I have time about, do I have time? About, um, I'm on a different clock here, so I don't know what that means. Um, so about optogenetics, because I think this is how we answer the question. Um, probably optogenetics will will tell us how the brain is wired as well, but uh, from the microcirculation point of view, it is important. Um, it's interesting that uh, when people talk about optogenetics, there have been some publications going right back to the 1970s, um, and it's all based on the idea of using opsins, and opsins are actually in the cells that uh, detect light in your eye. So, optogenetics works uh, very much like the way the cells in your eye already work to detect light and convert it into electrical um, signals. Um, in the case of optogenetics, you are genetically modifying cells like neuron cells, brain cells, and uh, you are able to turn them on and off depending on uh, the color of light that you shine on them. Okay? So, and that's important because if you want to know how the brain is wired, if you can turn specific neurons on, figure out what they do, what do they not do when you turn them off? Like what can you, or what can the rat or mouse not do when you turn it off? It tells you really what that part of the brain is being used for, or what that specific um, neurons, neural cell is doing. Okay, but you see all this work going on here, or at least you know, maybe one publication per year for some of the off, and then suddenly, wham! In 2007-8, um, lots of things happening, and it's becoming very, very, very important. Okay, um, how does it work? Well, you have um, an opsin, uh, which is a light-sensitive protein. Um, you get that from an algae, and uh, you take the gene from the protein, and then you insert it in the DNA, uh, uh, or insert the DNA from the gene A. Uh, from this into specific neurons, the neurons you want to study in the brain. Um, 
Neurons communicate by firing, that means they, put, uh, they, they transfer ions in and out of the cells and change the cell um, membrane voltage. And uh, so, you now can uh, make that particular cell, which is the same neuron except it's now light sensitive, you can make it uh, fire or not fire just by flashing light at it. Okay. So you can control the cells. Okay. Um, this is some detail of the activation. This is how the vector works using the virus carrier. And you get that inside the brain. You have usually um, a light fiber. This is a similar problem to what I talked about with imaging. Any kind of therapy has a similar problem. Getting it uh, to the specific place you want. Um, the most convenient way they find at the moment is not to have some kind of microscope or array of lenses is you have to use uh, fibers to directly get that light energy to the right place. Um, okay, and uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of that, well, except maybe some of you will be familiar with this idea, and I think it's already talked about a little bit this morning, so if you understood the previous lecture, then this should be um, already obvious to you. And so, you can buy these modules which will allow you to control uh, the mouse brain as long as the mouse um, cells have been, brain cells have already been modified uh, appropriately. Okay, maybe I'll skip over that. And um, the point I was making about the eye is that you have these light sensitive cells at the back of the eye which are converting the light into an electrical signal in the same way you're using the opsins, which are an active protein here, um, to control the cells. Okay, that picture of the eye, by the way, doesn't look very different to what um, it did a thousand years ago. Um, and this is the drawing produced by this very clever chap, um, Al Hazen, very famous um, Islamic scientist. Uh, you can see the tunic of cornea and so on. Vitria, the vitreous humor, and so on, uh, within within the eye. Okay, maybe I'll skip through a bit of this because um, we don't have time for it. But there are some nice videos here uh, from Ed Boyden who uh, shows you how that control is done. And back to the pericytes. We have the pericytes surrounding the. In the thelial cells, and according to our text books, these pericytes don't control the uh, flow of blood in the capillary, and that's what it says in this textbook diagram. Uh, but there are, well, there is evidence coming out now, there's a huge kind of controversy and battle in various nature papers about the pericytes do actually contract, the pericytes don't contract. Um, only the smooth muscle contracts and so on. So um, my understanding and what we at least wrote in our review which has just come out is that my understanding of the controversy is it all comes down to the definition of a pericyte. Right? If you define a pericyte differently you can say it's contracting. If you say this is a pericyte you say well this one is not contracting and therefore it doesn't happen. So somebody has to take control of the situation and uh, so, um, the way we got the images uh, of blood flow from OCT was basically we would take consecutive images. Uh, the bit that's moving, you see here, is flow. The bit that's not moving, well, not moving too much, um, is uh, the tissue surrounding it. So, if you do a cross correlation between one and the next, cross correlation is just telling you which bit is still the same and which bit is different. Uh, you can produce these kind of images that I talked about. Okay. Um, and from this, you can pick out the bit that is flowing uh, from the bit that is static. Notice that actually the speckles are a little different because these speckles have been moving around and those speckles were the same. These are averaged over whatever time the camera uh, was, was opened. Okay. And that's just detail of it, we take three pixels by three pixels um, and produce uh, one pixel. So three by three from that image, the same three by three from an image, uh, some fraction of 
that second later and compare the two together and produce this uh, image, which is just a measure of how well correlated it is. If it's highly correlated, it's not flowing. If it's, if it's not similar to what it was in the previous image, it has moved and therefore it's, uh, in our case, a moving blood cell. And we mask it out and pick out this moving cells. And we can do that at various depths in the tissue. So the nice thing about OCT is you can slice up different depths below the surface. Okay. And what we see looks very much like what you see uh, in the textbooks. And you can use this kind of thing for looking at psoriasis, for example. That's what a blood vessel might look like in the uh, normal OCT image. Uh, what's useful with uh, this kind of processing is that you can see all of the blood vessels and uh, not some nice as well. Um, this is how healthy tissue looks like. This is how the blood vessels, the knotted blood vessels that you have in a plaque of psoriasis looks like. Um, that's what the blood vessels look like on this little piece of skin that comes across the top of your nail. And here was one of the first videos that we did of uh, an arterial occlusion. So you see the blood vessels, the blood in the blood vessels here. When you occlude the brachial artery, it goes down and then it comes back up again and you get a reactive hyperemia. You can look at that in an individual vessel. Um, so you go and come back and you, get, you see it's actually a higher intensity when it comes back. And you can look at a reactive hyperemia at different depths. And I still haven't found any use for that, so <laughs> I'm still looking. Um, okay, so I've talked to you about all these uh, different techniques, possibly except photoacoustic uh, tomography, where we can produce images that look like that. With the OCT, we looked in this region. With the photoacoustic tomography, we looked in that region. With photoacoustic tomography, we can see deeper. We are using now the light that is scattered all around the place. And just briefly how that works is you put in a pulse of light. So you, you illuminate the whole um, this rectangle of tissue that I, I showed you there. Um, you use light that's absorbed by the blood, just by, only by the blood. Um, you have a very short pulse, and when it's absorbed by the blood, it vibrates the vessel. So you put in a pulse of light, bang, you get a, um, a vibration, actually of all frequencies. I woke a couple of people up there, sorry. Um, uh, you get a vibration which is all the frequencies, and then everything else is ultrasound. You just listen to what comes back with the ultrasound. So you vibrate the blood vessels, and you listen with the ultrasound. Um, and because you're using the same ultrasound system, uh, you can get a normal ultrasound image and you can superimpose your uh, photoacoustic image on top of it. And why is it important? Well, light has a contrast which is about 200 times better than ultrasound, so you can, instead of these grainy grey images, you can get quite, well, those ones don't look so bright, but the idea is that you have um, uh, much better contrast of the blood vessels than you would normally. You can also get slightly better resolution. To improve the resolution, you can use higher frequencies. <clears throat> but um, just like I say in all of the imaging techniques, you, get, you use higher frequency of ultrasound. Um, the ultrasound just doesn't penetrate uh, deeply into the skin. So once you get to 40 megahertz, you only see about two millimeters into the skin. Um, and so the resolution is not breaking this, this uh, 200 pixel limit and you can use different wavelengths and so the really important thing of photoacoustics is that it's spectroscopic it's like spectroscopic ultrasound so you can pick out oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin you can measure the amount of oxygen in the blood um, if you have uh, melanin you can look at uh, there. Um, you can look at uh, uh, melanoma and see how deep it is. And now with photoacoustics, you can see maybe 10 millimeters into the tissue. Not with very good resolution, but good enough uh, for this job. And see whether it has uh, penetrated too deeply. Okay. So the other um, thing, maybe I should skip this because, because uh, Adrian will talk a lot about OC.
OCT tomorrow. Um, the only thing we have to have here, it's maybe a little different, is, is to look at the small blood vessels from inside the coronary artery, looking to find small blood vessels uh, in uh, the basal vessel or in the, the vessel wall, um, because we believe that that might be indicative of whether that particular plaque is a problem. And this is a summary of what I talked about uh, today. And that's one of the most important things I wanted to get across to you. If somebody wants to sell you um, an imaging system that is um, that's, that's giving you one micron resolution and sees one millimeter or more than one millimeter into the tissue, uh, you should really ask them, uh, is that really possible? And usually the answer is that it will give you one micron resolution, but only when you're looking at this depth. Once you look at that depth, the resolution has got worse. Okay? So they're talking about two different things. That you get you do get this resolution, but only when you are looking close. You do see that deep, but then you don't get that resolution. So be very careful that you know if your project requires um, something over here, which many people would like, um, you're highly unlikely to get it. And thank you very much for being so patient. That's a very good question. <laughs> so, um, my idea behind this is that uh, I think, I have a job, yes. Um, I think that what's happening is that uh, if, you, if you look into any kind of scattering tissue, so the, the light is, is, going, is going around and it's being scattered every couple of hundred microns. Uh, so, you, the deeper you go, you have less and less of these photons that are going in and coming straight back. And so if this is the surface of the tissue, in order to get a good, so that your signal to noise gets worse and worse as you go down here. So you have more noise and, and uh, less signal as you go deep. So you can get sufficient signal to noise on that sort of square close to the surface. In order to get sufficient signal to noise deeper, you need to integrate over this or add up this much bigger voxel. Uh, a voxel is a, a 3D pixel, it's a 3D volume element. Uh, and in order to see deeper again, you need to integrate over that. So um, the signal to noise, what we call physicists call a point spread function. So um, otherwise, uh, point spread function is something that, that looks like that. Is um, it's getting bigger as you are going deeper into the, into the tissue. And so that general principle, despite the fact that these are extraordinarily different techniques, um, seems to hold, hold true right across these, these different imaging techniques. But if you have an MRI with the super resolution, they need something funny. algorithms and, and, uh, and not, not, uh, not deeper in the tissue. I, I'm talking specifically actually about the resolution in this direction. Um, I think it's easier to, to do it to improve the one in, in this direction. Yeah. The one in this direction is, is quite difficult. I think. Okay. Everybody's hungry. <laughs> yeah.